we're going to have some great experiences and we want to share some stories. Sometimes we've got to keep our mouth closed, ears open and our eyes because we're going to see things and probably hear things from Indigenous people. As we travel, you'll probably uh, you'll hear a little bit more conversation about the uh, different places that we will visit along the way. It's more of a sharing of knowledge and experiences in different places and listening to different people. Together, I think we learn a lot of stuff and we'll work together in this trip. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah we're, we're in for a good uh, good time together and uh, you know, I felt really proud to uh, associate uh, with Rumbalara and having come from up in this area not far away and and it's about developing things that that's appropriate culturally sensitive to to our mob and um, that's what they're doing in this place. Uh, Welcome to, to Rumbalara Elders Facility or Rumbalara's aged care site. Um, my name's Dean Walton. Um, I'm the Director of, of Positive Ageing and, and Disability Services. The site opened March 2012, like I said, 19 units, a 30 bed aged care facility um, and this activity centre which holds about 500 people. Um, our units on site have been full since April 2012. Um, we were a $30 million project, so when this was all being built, it was the, the biggest Aboriginal project in the country. I have, I have great respect for the Aboriginal community that as their elders become unwell and, and their needs are greater, they want them to stay at home and they want to care for their own and, and not see that they can't do it anymore and have to put mum or dad or nana, pop, run or uncle in, into aged care. So our main focus over there and is that it's not a place where you just go to sit and do nothing. It's now where you actually go and you age actively, you actually improve in your both physical and mental health, and you become active in the community or more active in the community if you weren't before you came in. So yeah, Uncle, Uncle Clem's actually our last original resident. So when we opened in March 2012, Uncle Clem moved in in April, so we did a three or four week of, of training staff and just getting used to the building and things like that. And then Uncle Clem moved in, so he's still here. This is a place where we bring some of the residents out just to participate on the equipment. And they don't know that they're being assessed and we're actually writing down and, and ticking off boxes that they are actually safe mobile wise. Um, their balance is good and things like that. A lot of facilities go to parks and take their res stuff like that, but we're, we're the only one in country Victoria that actually has one on site, which we're, we're really proud of. All right, good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's good to see that you've arrived safely on your journey. My name is Jeanette Crewe. I'm the chairperson of Yaka Indigenous Knowledge Centre. I'm a traditional owner from this country. It's my father's country. And it's the homelands of the Wamba Wamba Parapa Parapa people. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of this land. So the word um, Yakawa is, is a word in our language that means to seek over long distances. We, we initially wanted to do some training programs here in Janolokwin and we talked with TAFE and got a program together so they can contribute to the things that were happening at the time. The easiest thing I thought we would teach them about how to do family histories and then how to do their, their own um, family trees and how to research that information and do um, community history of our contribution and our place in this, this space. We were about six months in when someone said, gee, wouldn't it be good to have an exhibition? So I thought, well, wow, I've always wanted to have a, um, an historic photograph exhibition. So we came up with this. That was thought about, um, suggested, and done within two weeks. <laughs> um, at the end of those, that training, though, we didn't quite know what to do with the stuff. We didn't want to leave it at TAFE. We didn't want to give it to the town library. We didn't really want to give it to the land council. So the next alternative was to actually form Yahua. So we did that in 2003. My story was the traditional owner story. <laughs> And it talked about me growing up on the Mish and coming into town and integrating into this community. Um, as well as talking about um, 
the general white community that was living here, like the settlement of Deniloquin and how it's grown and how it was perceived to be, you know, set up on the sheep's back sort of thing. So it's... Um, so we talk about the early history of Deniloquin, my story and the newcomers after that. So we talked a little bit about um, the migrant families who were here when I was a kid um, and the ones that came in later. So, and we finished with, intermingled in that story is a fellow who came over from um, Iraq more recently, came over as a boat person. So we did a launch here and it was, um, it was um, quite emotional um, that night. And um, some people left like really upset, but knowing a bit more about those, you know, tragic stories. So, grew up till I was nine on the on the mish. So, when you said you hadn't seen a white person before, so who ran? Who? I said I had interacted. Oh, I have right. seen them um, because my father used to work, and all the men used to go out shearing and stuff. And sometimes they would come and pick them up. And sometimes we would go over to the, you know, old Morago station and get oranges, but we never, I never interacted with white kids before or been to a white school. There was a, there was a policy of segregation um, for our people, so we were segregated onto missions. Um, we'd be rounded up and put on there, um, and that's where we had to stay. Um, you could get exemptions, um, which meant that you had to ha carry what we now refer to as a dog tag. So if you had that exemption, you were allowed to move off the mission, but you weren't allowed to go back. So if you had family back there, you know, like, so if you applied for this dog tag and got it, you were out and you weren't allowed to visit family. But the policy changed from segregation then in the 60s to assimilation. So that was when a lot of the missions were being closed down um, and people were moved into the outskirts of town. So we were down the West End, um, next door to the um, sewage treatment works. Um, and slowly people were moved into different places around town. Quite a lot now lives down the West End, so just moving us into town caused a bit of controversy, didn't it, John? Um, Vincent. Because... <laughs> <Why? laughs> As you will know by now, there was a community already living at over the flats, and my understanding was that the people over there thought the houses that were being built in Macaulay Street were for them, only to discover it was to move us into town. So that caused a little bit of friction, I think, um, for some time. But you know, people who grew up in, on the mission and, and on the edges of town, and as I'm sure Vince and John will attest to, you know, those places, even though, you know, history will tell a different story, they're special places for some of us, you know, they have special places in our hearts because that's where family was and, you know, that's where strength was in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, one of the things it did to me that I recall is that all the men worked out that way. They worked on all the farms and you know, they had a lot of um, um, work on surrounding properties and most of them were gun shearers, but a lot of them were just, you know, farm workers. When they came into town, some of them didn't have transport. They didn't, so they didn't have work anymore, you know? And I know my father wasn't on the dole. He wouldn't, I don't think we were entitled to the dole back then, actually. Hey? No, I was just thinking, I don't think Blackfellas got the doll back then. There was, there was work in the, uh, the sawmills too. There was certain, um, yeah, there were a lot of um, people in the timber trade, a lot of Aboriginal people in the timber trade, especially out at Moonacullar because the Wirai forest that we're negotiating for now was one of the bigger forests that was, that was part of that timber industry. So there was a lot of work out there as well. Um, but you know, I don't remember being hungry out on a mission, but I do remember being hungry in town. 
you know, I, um, we couldn't live out of the forest the way we used to. Um, and we had to go to the shops and we didn't have work, so we didn't have money. And, you know, it was just a different lifestyle for us and it was, wasn't easy adapting, you know. As a kid, you don't understand that, but a lot of the stuff, um, a lot of history, I guess, there was a lot of confusion for me as a child coming in, and I didn't actually get to understand a lot of it until I was an adult and I was able to <coughs> talk to my aunties and uncles and parents about how it was for them. Uh, on behalf of this, this group here, we want to say a big thank you. It's just so good to come back yeah. and uh, see oh, what you guys are doing here and you make us feel proud. Because pe what people want to do here locally, but not only locally with people like Vince, is to make sure that there's some sort of permanent marker, some sort of commemoration on the fact mm. that there was a, a vibrant, alive community here Absolutely. that contributed so much and yeah. in so many ways. Mm. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. When we first came on this reserve, there was the old uh, sort of a, a shed with um, uh, bags, ba Hessian bags. Hessian bags all over. There was a bit of an old hut over here that I think, I don't know whether Dad purchased it or possessed it anyhow, we took it and uh, got in it and uh, we sort of extended onto that old hut and we lived just over there. My mum and dad come from, the, the dad, uh, mum come from Kudamandra and my dad come from Darlington Point. Yeah. So how they got to be here, I, got, I don't know. I could tell you exactly that because I was very young. You were we had a lot of, uh, lot of stuff that was going on here. Alcohol, no drugs, but a lot of alcohol. Many of fights and things, sorting out stuff with some of the families and extended families and whatever. But there was an underlying foundational stuff, like this foundation thing is still here and the floods have been over it, but it's still here. It was like that in our communities, in this community here. It was solid stuff that our people just supported each other. And like we said before, we never had, we never had much. We had very little, but we had, we had something that was special within us. We were allowed to, to interact and join in with other parts of the community, particularly the Salvation Army, weren't we, Doug? Uh, that was the, the, probably the main thing. It's like you coming over from the, crossing the bridge and swimming with us and felt very much part of this here. It didn't, didn't matter. Nobody said, well, hey, listen, you're the wrong colour, sis. I didn't, yeah, actually, you, I you. honestly didn't know that I was any different. No, you. no. And, and I've never had um, anything thinking that, you know, black people were black people and white people. I've always thought we were all the same. All people, Well, yeah. we used to sing the song, chorus, remember? Yeah. Whether yellow, black or white. Yeah, Jesus all the precious in his sight, yeah. All the precious in his sight. That's right. And we were never treated differently in the Salvation Army in your mum and dad's time as officers there. Uh, the love that was shown by them and the other people and leaders. And so we were, well, we didn't understand that word reconciliation, but when you talk about it, we were actually doing it anyhow. There's something special through the salvos and I can't, you know, it's really hard to sort of put it all down in a Dougie that yeah. exactly, but we just took it as, well, I guess this is our lot, you know. Um, the Aborigines can't get in the town and uh, we can't be sort of too much part of all this other stuff that's happening. My mother always used to say to me, son, we're not second class citizens. And I said, mum, can you give me a look at first class? <laughs> You've heard it said many times, oh, the black fellas, you know, never work, lazy, unreliable, always on a walkabout. They got no understanding what that walkabout is because the walkabout time is actually time out. It's not that you're dodging issues. The influence from this little hut here, the influence of this place has been on us, on our lives over all those years, and they, Meryl? The Salvation Army was, uh, they were about and involved in going right back in the early days when Captain Edith McKenzie was here. Uh, that, that, that goes back for 
right back into the, uh, the early 50s or something, whatever yeah. it was. They didn't just tell us about Jesus. Uh, they showed us that way that had a lasting impre impression on our lives. They demonstrated what Christianity was all about, really. We never had much, we had very little, but we had, we had something that was special within us, didn't it? You know? We had plenty, we had, we had, not, not we had everything. much, but we had plenty of what, yeah. what was really needed. That's right, exactly. I want to, uh, I want to remember and I want to honour those people of our families and uh, the loved ones who, who lived on this place, who this place they called home. Just over there. Just there. This is, this is our land there, yeah. this sort of thing. Of, of the but anyhow, folks, we, we will move back, but this is the flats, so whenever you hear about the flats, you'll say, I've been there. I understand some of that history, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, but out of this place comes the hope for us that we can press forward, we can keep going forward. So we feel honoured to be on this trip and I hope that everyone realises uh, just how significant uh, this trip is, uh, not only for Uncle Vince but also for our people, also for um, our people who know Christ and who don't know Christ and just the blessing that brings uh, because you've definitely been a blessing in our lives, Uncle Vince and Annie Enid. And also, I think through showing the love of Christ, through uh, you know bringing the hammer and nails, um, Uncle Vince and his family came to know Christ, and a lot of our people came to know Christ through that. So as I walked on the river yesterday, I thought, um, you know, for me, it's a, how do, how can we symbolise uh, the significance of your country? So went down this morning, and I, I gathered some of the sand from the river. So I just in, invite people uh, who are here today just to come and grab some sand and place it in their hand as a representation of that. Something so beautiful. Something so good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of our lives. <laughs> So the aim of this evening is to um, hear each other's stories. We have a number of cultures that are represented here this evening. And so we've already had the purposes of our trip emerging, and this is what they are. To introduce all of us who are on the bus, 42 of us, to Aboriginal and Salvation Army history in the area, whichever area we've been in. We still have many obstacles. We have many things to overcome in this land. But uh, I can see all positiveness. Things are happening, aren't they, with our people? And uh, I, I believe the most important thing is uh, giving our hearts to Jesus and, and let, letting him be our guide and our helper and our friend. It's beautiful to be here today to say sorry and it's lovely to see what God is doing, healing and restoring the land and waking up the Aussies and the Salvos to connect. And I praise God that I can be a voice for you and I'm going to be a voice and I'm going to fight like William Booth said. I grew up knowing almost nothing about Aboriginal Australia, even though I grew up in a land that was once um, lived in and cared for by Aboriginal people. And in some ways, it's only in perhaps the last decade that this is, is an important a part of my journey to discover those connections and to discover the, the heritage of this land. As a younger Aboriginal Christian leader, uh, 
It's been a very special trip for me to be um, with my Aboriginal uh, Salvation Army elders. Um, has been an incredible experience. Uh, just quickly, like 64 years ago, I encountered the Salvation Army on, on the riverbank at Deniloquin. Some of you know where Denny is. And it was there that uh, my whole family and our lives just uh, changed for the better. There's some great stuff that's happened on that reserve and I spent many years there. And uh, we learnt lots of things. I learnt, uh, I guess, a lot of my musical stuff uh, through the Salvation Army, um, banding and uh, other uh, instruments that I, I was encouraged to, uh, to participate with, sort of thing. So it's been a great journey for me and uh, both Enid and I, uh, as we've travelled uh, many miles, even our caravans and cars, meeting people across Australia, uh, just sharing some of our life with them, not preaching to anyone, but just sharing something of our experience. I'm glad that um, after all these years, um, I've still maintained uh, a pretty good, strong sort of uh, focus on where I'm wanting to go and what I want to do and what the sort of things I can do. Having worked in lots of different organisations around the countryside, creating more pathways for Aboriginal people and others. You know, we talk about reconciliation and I'm saying, that reconciliation and this gathering getting together, this is what it's all about. Pastoral care is what we ought to be on about if we want to bring people to the kingdom of God. So thank you very much. Thank you. I want to know, know, know. I want to show, show, show. I want to go, go, go. I want to tell everyone. That God never made any junk And that's the good news Oh yeah, pick it up Steve I want to know, no, no. I want to show, show, show I want to go, go, go I want to tell everyone That God never made any junk And that's the good news Oh Lovely to see the flags there representing our people. And I think that when Aboriginal people come through our door and the first thing I look for, is there anything in this place that might be saying to me, you're welcome in this place? You might say, yeah, we're an army for all people. As long as we come over and be like us, we're saying our army needs to open up. And the place that this speaks about is the cross where we all come together as brothers and sisters and we share, and then we go away from the cross, you'll notice the blue, the blue streams. <laughs> um, those blue streams are representing the Spirit of God. We go as one in the Spirit. We don't go away as black and white. And what has taken place that we have, the Salvation Army, you'd have to acknowledge that we've moved into a little bit more middle class, and we've left behind the people that our dear founder told us to get out there and work with the marginalised people in our communities. And there's plenty of them, I can tell you. And we've got, we got plenty of our mob, and there's a few of them over the river, and there's a few down, the, down yonder, and there's a few in the streets over here, I know, um, outside the kingdom of God. And, and a lot of our places, sometimes they don't come in because they don't feel all that sort of welcome in the place. And we're, we're making a real effort through, uh, through divisional and through the headquarters and whatever. Something that struck me actually is that that you said, but, but actually I've been thinking about ever since you said it, which is that you know, Indigenous culture is not just one culture, it's like over 300 yeah. different cultures. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think to myself, you know what, if we learn how to live with 300 different cultures the way yeah. the Indigenous people did yeah. before we arrived and stuck everything up, um, we'd be better off. Yeah, like, absolutely. That's right. Because yeah. yeah. there's, there's a diversity, I think, within every culture. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose, you know, how do we learn that? Mm. We learn that through sitting down and yarning with yeah, each other yeah, around yeah. the table. That's and um, That's where it happens. Uh, you know, where we had 300 nations of people in this one land that we now call Australia, a time before we needed a word reconciliation. We talk about reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples, but we are actually like 300 peoples in one. And you look at Aboriginal Christians and the way we work across boundaries all the time, and um, that's across church boundaries, um, we're the greatest example of ecumenism that there is. 
Um, and there's so much the wider Australian church can learn from us, just about how we build relationship with one another, which comes through love. And, yeah. um, you know, Uncle Vince talks about me getting fired up. And part of that is because there's just some really simple stuff that we can do. Yes. This stuff isn't rocket science. It's no. about loving one another, which for me is central to what Jesus told us to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the simple steps the Salvation Army could take, and it relates to recognising our 300 nations. And if we recognise those 300 nations, it's about recognition with dignity um, and uh, it's who we are and you know we also have to think about mob who are part of the stolen generations and their stories to be honored as well and remembered and and grieved for and and loved through that experience um, which you know is such a traumatic experience and so many of us suffer trauma it's starting from even the beginning when they become cadets yeah you know yeah. And uh, compulsory as a part of their studies around the cultural competence mm. yeah. or, or yeah. officers or them becoming officers. Yeah. And I, I think for us, um, you know, similar, you know, we the Salvation Army has seen us, we've been around for a few years, but now we want to be heard. You know, we look at self-determination, what does that look like within the Salvation Army context? Uh, you know, letting us lead our ministries, yeah, that's right. uh, resourcing, supporting, and really giving us a sense of influence within the Salvation Army, I think is going to be critical. And, you know, they're things that don't take a lot of effort. It takes commitment. Now's the time to do it. If that's we're ever right. going to make a change and make yeah. a statement about who we are as a Salvation Army, you know, our bread, bread and butter is made from going to the marginalised, mm. but yet we fail to look at the marginalisation of the First Nations people uh, and, and what we need to do as an army to be able to, to service them better, to minister the, to them better, to walk alongside them. Our, our people have the solutions. We, we definitely know what the issues are. We yeah, don't yeah, need to be told right. anything. No, so no. we know what the issues are and we know what the solutions are. Yep. But uh, we've got to be given that opportunity, I yep. think, to be able to uh, speak into it. That's right. Yeah. I think the, the, the Aboriginal people right throughout Australia and all the different sections or wherever have so much to offer and you know what I come to? I just think that all this sort of stuff and I think you touch on it too, Cheryl, is that it's all so simple but it's so difficult. Mm. I think we're, we're in a different position and I don't think I'm over optimistic but I am quite optimistic about the change because I see these guys coming up, I see things happening that wasn't around when I was around. And we are, we are part of the possibilities and the hope that's going on because we're, we're starting to create it. We're creating it here mm -hmm. uh, on, this, on this journey and uh, all of us will go away, myself included, because you're, you're teaching me something. You're, you're helping me. You know, it's, it's not all, I oh, think we've got to give these fellows all the, the Aboriginal stuff, you know, we've got, to, we've got to feed them up well, you know, sort of thing yeah. and all that. It's a, it's a shared thing. It's, and it's, you hit it on the head. It's simple, isn't it? It's love, respect, accepting, and realising that Aboriginal people, we have so much to offer. Now, I the, the churches, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. You know, with Art, she's, um, she's certainly a, a real testimony and she reminds me much of my mum. Um, and uh, because she's been through the mill a bit herself, uh, but found this a new life and release. And then also recognising our own spirituality. Look at this one. This corner. Look at that one, eh? Wow. Beautiful. This is what we do, and we're making these for the. We're making these for the um, <laughs> hospital, and this was made for the 2006 Commonwealth Games. And there was um, 38 tribes of Victoria that represented, and um, this one was made for the tribe that's here, which is a better for better for, which is a different one, say Barapa Rapa, but it's better for better for traditional sound. The eagle feather is the eagle is the most dominating. Um, totem from all tribes in Australia and uh, all around the world. You'll see it in different, uh, different countries around the east. Yep. 
Did you have any eggs at all there, right? one egg there, right? So that's what you do with emu eggs. And there's a lot of colours in there. That yeah, make. there's about yeah. 15. 15 Very different up. shades. I'll bring it around and show But it's really, it's really, the shell is very thin, in it? Yeah, it's but, but it, looks, it looks thicker than what it is. Mm. And all the different shades. So, yeah. Look, it's so lovely to catch up with you again. Very special. And, um, I'm going to get Oh, oh, oh. oh, we always carry on. Because our families, go, our families go a long way back, you know. Yeah, they're not too far back. Yep. But uh, in, in my language uh, and the language I've been teaching these fellas here, it's, it's now called We Have To Go. Yeah. <laughs> well, the feeling uh, for me is, uh, is one of, certainly one of joy because it's, it's been a great experience and uh, well, it's been great for me uh, personally, uh, but I know that uh, there's been so many people uh, on this coach has, has just received uh, such a blessing and, and, and a challenge and, and uh, you know, just they've experienced something that they've never experienced before. The, this, this trip has just given me, it's given me a real buzz. It's given me uh, a nearly like a new lease of life in, in, in terms of that there are so many good people with good attitudes that, that want to see a lot of changes in regards to how the Indigenous issues right across Australia, within the church, outside the church, in the community, how do we, how do we make things happen that's better for our people uh, and also better for the whole nation because we're, we're creating opportunities. And looking at and hearing some of the people talk and share on this bus uh, sort of thing, I think that uh, to take that away from here and to know that this is not just uh, a bit of a spurt and it's finished, this is, this is something that's going to linger for a long time within the hearts of people and the minds. And I think it's going to help to create a whole lot of things that I think that for many of us never thought that this was even possible, you know? I think um, what I would love to see more of, uh, more of an acceptance of Aboriginal people within different parts of communities right around Australia. Now, people will probably see this, read this, or try to understand this. Oh, no, we're, we're a free country. We're open to everybody. Yes, we are. We are a very welcoming country. But we're not very welcoming to many of our own Indigenous people here in Australia. Uh, and they're, they're cast off in some of their communities. And, you know, some of those smaller places that we've been through, like the Bell Ranel and, and, and Kerrang and places like that, where there's not many people, but there's a few Aboriginal people there. And for many of them don't have a real sense of, hey, this is a place for us too. Like, we're here and we can make this make this town work or the city work, whatever. How do we create this space for people to come into, to have this dialogue, just like we've been having on the coach here, you know? So um, it's, it's forward, it's about going forward. Uh, it's not staying in the one spot where we've been for many years. It's not about trying to change or turn the clock back, but it's about what did we learn from and what do we understand our history and where are, we go where are we going forward from here on in? And to know that I'm going to play a part and you're going to play a part too. And all the other guys and people uh, that have been with us on this coach uh, have a, going back with a, a stronger conviction, going back with a, with a hope that I hope that I can change some things in the little part of the world where I live. Not in separation or isolation or whatever, but as we work together, we can build a better nation for this place. And being a, a follower of Jesus, um, seeing that change happen in my own community, in my own area, and, and, and I'd love to see that within the Salvation Army, that we have our recognition of our First Peoples in every Salvation Army across Australia, um, so that when they come to our, our halls, it's their hall as well. It's not just the white person's hall or the Chinese person's hall or any other race, but it's actually their hall. We're on their land. I've been interested in the um, Aboriginal peoples for a long time, and it's just been a joy to share with other people of like mine, and I think there's a, a huge journey ahead, but there's hope that we can make some changes, and I just thank the Lord for the opportunities. He's given me to be part of this great tour.
over these few days, it's been great to see the respect that people have shown each other, openness to each other for different, uh, uh, many cultures coming together. And in every case, each person has been open to the other and has been ready to accept and welcome the other person as they are. And to me, I think that's critical to this whole journey and been a wonderful part of it. Uh, I've had a great time. It's really inspiring, I think, with the different age groups that are on here and where they'll take this back to. Uh, an important thing to remember is uh, cultural competence is a journey, it's not a destination. We enter at uh, different points in that continuum and just that uh, the seeds that have been planted on this trip that people be intentional about and t continue to nurture that. May the God of creation warm your heart like the campfires of old. Bring wisdom and peace as shown by the first peoples of this land. Shake off the dust from the desert plains by the everlasting rains, the refreshing ones, followed by the glow and warmth of the sun. Let the light of God show us the right path to take and stand tall like the, the big river gums drawing water from the ever-flowing waters. Amen.